Alexander Bard, of course, philosopher, Daniel Fraga, author of Ontological Design, uh, co-host of mine on social, uh, Yuri Yukik, who is a, um, a new face, actually, a guy who's been involved with Parallax Sangha for a while, and uh, and also an Urbit uh, developer or engineer or something that, that you're involved with, Urbit, right? now. And um, yeah, that, that's our crowd at the moment. And um, maybe just to begin with, each of you, how, what's your connection to this world of digital nomads? Maybe start there. I can start if you like to some of the theorists around here. Please. I believe that John Sedeckvist and I invented the term global nomad in 1998. I'm sure Howard Bloom is up against us or something like that for that term. <laughs> Uh, nobody really talked about digital back then. It's like, that's like 10 years later. It, it was still electronic or virtual or something like that, or computer or whatever. But eventually the term digital age got stuck, but, but that's like 10 years later. But global nomad was the first term used, widely used, what we call digital nomad today. Um, the point here is that we're all nomads. We originally were nomads. Uh, we started, some of us, at least some, some lazy, arrogant bastards started settling permanently in a few places like some 5,000 years ago. The vast majority of us remained nomads. Uh, I think possibly the last nomads we know, at least, are left in the Amazonas or New Guinea or something like that from the last 30 or 40 years. But basically, anybody now has got Wi-Fi and a T-shirt and, and jeans is considered to be permanently settled. So the entire evolution towards permanent settlement took that long. Now we've also discovered over the last few years, especially that we have large populations that are semi-nomadic. They basically they're nomadic, but they walk between two points. So you say you walk between the mountain and the sea, and depending on the season, you move back and forth. And these populations are often warrior cultures. Um, the last major one of those would be the Mongols. Um, but before the Mongols, we had tons of them. And, and, and these periods that we consider to be like um, anarchic or chaotic in history, like what people are wondering about and, and nomadism return, it turns out that those periods were at least as civilized as the ones that we were settled. So see my nomadic culture and civilization has been with us even longer than permanent settlement and has often been far more advanced. Gebekli Tepe is a very popular example of such a see my nomadic culture. And we're even now studying the sea nomadic cultures and the first sort of permanently settled ag agrarian cultures and making comparative studies with them since they've lived side by side for like forever. Uh, and a perfect example is Mongols versus the Chinese. Uh, it could also be say Tatars versus Russians in Russia, et cetera. So we have, we have loads of examples of these peoples who sort of fought with each other and been neighbors. And some of them have been sea nomadic because I've been settled. So what's happening with digital is that with digital, space disappears. It really starts, Marshall McLuhan said, with, with the, with the um, it started with the telegraph. So if you go back to the telegraph in the 19th century, it was a shock when you could telegraph a message between say New York and London. And if something happened in London, people would know about it in, in, in New York only a few minutes later. The kind of news feeds we have today with anything that happens, a house falling down in an earthquake in Turkey is supported live in front of us wherever we are uh, with our laptops. That, that was unheard of until the late 19th century. But starting with the telegraph and now exploding with digital, when anybody can have a conversation with anybody else at no cost at all from anywhere in the world, uh, we can have and move our fat bodies with airplanes around the planet if they want to within 24 hours. But listen, what's really happened is that everything is now in real time everywhere, all of the time it's, it's simultaneously. That means space has disappeared. And that also means the whole idea of permanent settlement or settlement of any kind being an alternative to nomadism has gone out the window. So we're entering an age where we're basically all going nomadic. Uh, we're going nomadic in this conversation. We're nomadic here in many different countries, many different places around the world, just ending up on a Zoom call together. Uh, we don't really care where people are located right now. We all care about the geography of being here in this meeting, meaning space has disappeared. This means we will from now on be totally focused on time philosophically from now on until the end of history. Ironically, a time constant, end of history. So time is more important than ever. We protect our calendars and we don't want to waste time on things we're not interested in. 
if we're not entertained or informed, we don't want to waste time on anything. Well, maybe sex, but nothing else besides that. So we're all going nomadic in the fundamental sense. And I'd like to start the conversation there before we go into this idea that you're nomadic maybe 10 or 50 years of your life, then you set in because you've got a family and kids, and then you start moving again or whatever. But we're traveling more than ever. Tourism being the biggest industry on the planet, about 20% to 25% of the entire global economy is now about tourism. So before we go into the details of that, I'd just like to propose this idea that we've gone nomadic again. Right. Thank you very much. Yuri, do you want to follow up on that and maybe introduce yourself a bit? And also, can, is there anything you can say about a bit and what that's aiming towards and where that might be of interest here for people in the nomad conversation? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how I ended up in this conversation, but uh, let me see if I can tie a bit into this. Um, so, insofar as we are communicating via technology and technology like connects us there is fundamental ways in which the way software is built influences our interaction so usually we complain about you know the algorithms and stuff like that like oh the civil algorithm and whatever but there's also like a very real sense in like how computers are made and like you know software as a service and like even bottom up from like the the kernel level of like how the processor works and all that stuff which like all these technical decisions which sort of like influence later influence the way we interact with computers and everything around it and so like the web tree world, world of blockchains tries to like fix the financial aspect of this but it's like very lackluster in in, in in the fact that like you cannot solve everything with like blockchains it's it's ridiculous like you don't want to have a global state for just the chat messaging app like it's ridiculously hard to build a chat messaging app which is truly decentralized on the primitives meaning like on the software we have now and so urbit is saying like hey guys like the software we have sucks let's build it from the ground up so that we can actually do the the things that we we want to do like the way we organize and and stuff like that and so how this ties into digital nomadism is like i would argue that like digital nomadism is like not something that special if we don't unlock the the software capabilities right because like who are the digital nomads i mean they're basically people working for like web2 companies like it's it's i mean in a sense it's real what alexander says and how everything is exploding in different ways but it's going to suck if if we are stuck in like using web2 software like the digital nomads are, are, are like working in boring companies and doing boring stuff. <laughs> I mean, so so I'm basically working on on Urbit, and like Urbit has already built this software platform. Um, it's in progress still, but I'm building on top of Urbit, trying to build, like, yeah, I won't go into what I'm trying to build, but this is basically the connection I'm trying to make, and like my thinking revolves around how you know the the software that we that we have influences our sort of decisions etc and this is what i've picked up a lot from the urban crowd and i just fill in here a little wider definition so we're gonna go big on bitcoin and blockchain and stuff like that and i totally agree with you that the guys with the laptops basically the digital nomad is the person says wherever my laptop is that's my home right but we have already digital nomadism here in another form which is already very successful and we should compare with that those places are called dubai and singapore so if you go to dubai and singapore which are the two wealthiest places on the planet at the moment and the two most trafficked airports you can imagine and wi-fi is excellent and all that you sit down there and talk to people who live in dubai and singapore you ask them will you live in a dictatorship and they just go yeah so what i'll just move with my feet i move so i would i, I would widen the definition of digital nomadism to people who just, if they don't get what they want in a specific place, they democratically just move somewhere else. By having that definition as a starting point, I think it makes more sense to eventually go into 
our sort of utopian almost perspective of like what could Bitcoin and blockchain do and, and, and what does it mean to live with Web3, 3.0 decentralized communities. But I think it's good to start with something that really obviously is digital nomadism on a massive scale and successfully so. And this is why I always propose that city states are the future. I think empires like America, Russia, and China are bound to fall apart eventually. And I'm incredibly impressed with places like Dubai and Singapore for how well they work. And they work simply because anybody moves their nose, they'll get out in a second if they don't get what they want. And I think that's a good definition of digital nomadism. Mm, I think that city-state could, idea could be something to, to zoom in on a bit later. Uh, Daniel, I want to bring you in and let you introduce yourself and share some thoughts. Just before that, I actually want to say, since half of our guests seem to have been eaten in the jungle by something, uh, if anybody else here is a digital nomad uh, and would be interested in joining the conversation, since this is supposed to be a symposium, uh, write in the chat and then I'll see about bringing you in. And uh, with that, uh, Daniel. Thanks, Owen. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Daniel uh, and I call myself these days an ontological designer. Um, and I'll explain what that is in a bit. So what is, for me, a nomad? Uh, a nomad is someone who can plug onto flows of capital and someone who can, by being plugged onto these flows of capital, be physically mobile and independent. So yeah, it's someone who, with a laptop, with modern information technology, that has a connection to the internet, that is able to somehow do paid work and get money to live anywhere and benefit from the infrastructure that exists. In the internet decade, right, the 2010s was, was the decade that enabled a lot of these peripheral workers to tag along with the tech industry's obscene growth. So people who get to live at the margins or move around, but they're basically tagging along, they're sort of positive parasites to, to the tech industry and to the internet and the startup decade. But I think that the nomads of the 2020s, which is the AI decade, they're not going to be people who tag only two technologies. Uh, so you have the anywheres and you have the, the, the somewheres, but we should add a third category here, which is the everywheres. And I think this is what's lacking in the somewheres, anywheres dichotomy, which is a traditional sort of, you know, it's really urbanization versus the rural. We all, we all know that anywhere in the world where you moved from the countryside to the city, your chances of success in life increased 100 times over. Anywhere in the world where urbanization happened, that was the case. Whoever was urbanized first had an advantage. It's the same thing here. Uh, it's hard, you know, I, I can bet on it that digitalization means that if you, if you consider yourself like spaces disappeared, you've gone online, you create your identity online, you're no longer even uh, an, an anywhere, you are an everywhere. You, you don't even care about being aware. And that is what Deleuze meant with the nomad. And we picked up here, I think, in this conversation. So think of like the, the somewhere is the ones that really need a place to stay somewhere, whether it's zero countries or the losers, ultimately. And, and on, on top of that, we got the anywhere. So like in travel anywhere, they go from one place to the next, but they're still concerned with where they're located. Their capital is tied specifically to a specific place or or their investments are in a specific language only spoken in a certain area or something like that. Those, those are those are the anywheres. But the, the thing here is that the, the people who fly are the everywheres. For me, it's precisely this ability to locate, the ability to, within discourse, to say an, there is an everywhere, there is a somewhere, there's an anywhere, there's a nowhere. It seems like that's the ability that is going to be deeply disrupted. And that's what's going to truly make us nomadic. Um, the discourse of power, leveraging technology, leveraging, you know, capital that, you know, says that a rural person now goes into a city and now their life changes. That gives it, that's a new identity. That's a, that's a, that's a new name. That's a new flow. Um, but for me, nomadism is not so much the transition between one paradigm and another paradigm. And what's the one that comes after that? That's for me, the wrong question of nomadism. For me, the right question of nomadism is the ability to put a name and a label and then design all the you know, logistics around an identity. That is the question of nomadism. It's, 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 it seems to me like it's, a, it's going to be a discursive design problem that AI is, you know, we've all been seeing what ChatGPT is doing, that is AI is going to completely break. The identity has been completely broken. 
Yeah, but wait a second. Well, my pointer is that the global empire is already reality. It's what technology does. Technology knows no borders. It has no interest in borders at all. Data travels fast in the, at the speed of the speed of light from any data cloud to any other data cloud. Satellites are now everywhere in the universal. There's not a single spot left of the planet that isn't covered by satellites. And they're all watching the world simultaneously. That means the phallic gaze has arrived. When I say that the internet is God, I mean precisely this. And in the sense that the father age is over, the father has become the internet itself. So it's definitely taking on sort of a priestly phallic gaze type of role. It's operating within a global empire. The book we wrote called The Global Empire is about how technology achieves the global empire. Human beings go increasingly local, but if you're smart, then you're either tied to the local, that's my point, or the local is just one of many localities where you're located. And all those localities are you, in your mind anyway. You're part of that global empire, meaning you're an everywhere person. And you realize that the vast majority of people cannot follow you in that process. But if you're there, you have such an advantage compared to anybody else and for, from any view they have. But that is, that is definitely worth called a new paradigm just to basically provide this, this nomadic concept to people so they, they can get ahead and understand that wherever my laptop is, that's my home, and then start traveling. That's my point. So there's like a distinction between traveling in this course and traveling in in location. Precisely. And that yeah, is yeah. I mean, I mean, if if, if you travel, I mean, travel is a spatial category. Right? We don't time travel. We just follow time or bound to time, unless you're a Hollywood idiot or something. But no, time is the absolute. We're stuck with time. We're gonna die one day. Uh, we, we value everything in our lives depending on when we expect our death date to occur. And, and then we throw ourselves back to now and then we try to make you know our life as meaningful as possible and prioritize things that we find important. So we don't travel in time. The traveling is a space and that's, that's no longer important since you can connect with anybody anywhere in the world in no time at all. So other values that explode, for example, time. What are you doing with your calendar? Google Earth has been important for Google. But it's nothing compared to what Google, the emphasis Google are placing into Google Calendar. That is their big thing. Because that's where the value is at. Just an example of how space dissolves itself, only becomes important maybe for the masses, but at the bottom level of society. Whereas for the rest of us, time is the only thing that's of the essence. Time is the absolute. And when time is the absolute, everything is valued according to that as well from a human perspective. As an absolute, and along with all other absolutes, at the end of the Father Age, I think time has also been dissolved through the internet. When you say, Alexander, that the internet is the phallic gaze, well, then the phallic gaze has 5 billion phallic gazes or 7 billion phallic gazes everywhere. Or no, no, no. And times as much no, as that. No, no, no. 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 Let me think. They're going they go towards is, one my gaze. Point is, my because point is, data this, this has been data. profoundly yeah. dissolved and demultiplied. So to say that, there, the distinction here uh, persists that there is nomadism in the, the, the physical sense and nomadism in the discursive sense. And unless you understand that how to navigate nomadism uh, in the discursive sense, you're done. Uh, and to, to understand that nomadism uh, uh, in the discursive sense, you need to have a strategy because the ability to determine what time is, what place is, what values uh, uh, might you want to choose? Uh, that's precisely charting your way as you navigate a nomadic discourse. Unless, of course, you want to tag along to another one, but, but we must become savvy and strategic about selecting these discourses. It's, 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 it's this old mantra that after, after deconstruction, we must reconstruct. Uh, and to know how to reconstruct is the stage we are in right now. And we must learn how to reconstruct values in discourse uh, under penalty of being chewed up by others who know how to manipulate the, the discourse. And believe me, who know are leveraging AI and will have an incredible advantage over those who do not. Uh, that's why they call it a race. <laughs> That a nomadic flow. Uh, time has dissolved, so that didn't happen, according to Daniel Fraga. So. <laughs> it's a total chaos this evening. Uh, well, apparently here's a, here's a major disagreement between me and Daniel. So, 
Let's see where that leads us. So where does digital nomadism intersect with day-to-day -day politics? Because I know one of our guests here was, or a supposed guest, he's not actually here, was thinking about um, unionization of nomads and trying to get together to exert some kind of influence over the political structures, I guess, potentially the financial structures. And Alexander, I think you know Serge and have spoken to him about that. Can yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can represent, it's got to be a lot of me tonight, apparently, because then they're here. I work with Serge and Anastasia. So what we're planning is that digital nomad is, is exploding and it's, people are aware of it. And for example, if you go to Southern Europe, every small town in Southern Italy is onto this trend. Like, can we, can we have digital nomads move here? They pay taxes for a while. What kind of arrangements can we make? Have, you hear about digital nomad visas. They're very popular. So th there's, there's an eagerness to learn how digital nomads can be served and become temporary living in different places before they move into the next one. So you're not trying to make people migrate somewhere and, and, and move there permanently. You've realized that that's over. Uh, the vast majority of people will move only temporarily. We get Futsum in here, for example. We might talk to him later in the conversation. He's an Eritrean living in Sweden. And he's, of course, multicultural moving around. And I don't think he intends to stay in Sweden all his life at all. So that could be a good example. But there's an interest on one side for communities to be more welcoming towards digital nomads. For some, some of them even desperately so. They realize like some places realize that tourism is their only way of life they could possibly imagine. You go to Bali or Greece, everything's about tourism, right? So some places where digital nomadism is their thing. And, and, and then you've got tons of people who are becoming digital nomads, especially young people who realize that for the next 10 to 15 years, I have no reason to stay in one place. I'd like to move around. I can take work with me whenever I want to, make enough money, and I can just travel the world. So I, I get a totally different experience than my parents had from seeing the world myself personally for like 15 years before I settle, maybe, if I ever do. And you need, these two groups need to meet. And this is the traditional fair that you have in a Dubai or a Lisbon or somewhere like that. That's what Anastasia is interested in, is to see, because she used to work for the World Economic Forum before. So she's interested in saying, can, can we just create a fair, say maybe in 2024, maybe move it literally every year to have a place where people who are interested in digital nomadism and all aspects of it could just meet and make it easier to move around and get the visa. So that's that's what the work with Anastasia Search is all about. Can I jump in here? Mm, I think, I think I, I'd like always, I want to take a step back and ask, what where, where do these digital nomads make their money? And they make their money most of the time in the tech industry today. Uh, and I think this is important to answer your question, Owen, uh, about you know data led politics for the digital nomad and and how that how that plays out because the taxes that they'll be paying in these towns uh, come from a booming tech industry. So a few years back, I saw this super cool speculative design project about a endangered species of wolf. And it was about a faraway future in which the only way that this, this species of wolf could survive uh, was to have a little tag on it. Each wolf would have a tag, would have a name, would be character. And there would be loads of cameras around the forest that would film these wolves move around the forest and there would be a reality show. People would bet on the wolves, they would put money on their favorite wolves, they would procreate they would kill the other wolves it was a whole thing and people would pay to see that and that's the the way that the wolf survived and the, the purpose of the project was to show that hey in the future the best way to save say a wolf was to plug it into the flows of capital uh do you know what is the most successful animal species on the planet other than humans well it's cows and chickens because humans need to grow cows and chickens to kind of eat them if you count success as scale. Now, what do I, what am I going with this? That these small towns here and there that desire to be more attractive, make a little bit more money and call more people, they must think to these first principles and think, okay, how are we actually plugging ourselves into these flows of capital? And how can we be strategic about it? You know, are we an Instagram mobile city that literally lives off of a picture? If you go to Portugal to Porto, the whole city has a tourism industry based on a postcard, on a view, because people post that. And people can post that, there's advertising, they can make money off of it. So if we think down to this sort of more core basic level of how does it, how do I plug onto flows of capital? How do I as an individual or me as my community 
plug onto these flows of capital? What industries am I tapping into? What services, et cetera? I think that's a smart way to think about, about, about digital nomadism. And, and if we don't think in these first principles, uh, then we're going to be thinking all wrong and the structure of our thought is going to be wrong and we're going to mess up in, in, in a fast paced age. So we need to get our basics right for the next 10 years to think this through. There's a major difference here though, between digital nomadism and tourism for these places. When you're a digital nomad, you're very concerned with who you're going to meet. So you want to meet people your own age that challenge you and that like you, you want to get laid, all those things. So it's very different from tourism in that sense. And they figured this out already. This is exactly what this is a whole new business to deal with in the sense that already, if you're digital, you're going you're gonna to stay longer than a tourist would. You're not going to stay as long as a migrant would. But you're going to stay long enough to really be concerned with who you're going to run into. And it's actually offering spe a specific subculture, for example, a haven. Uh, it's a perfect example of the ones that have figured out how you become successful with digital nomadism. And of course, then the large scale versions of that are places like Dubai and Singapore. Smaller countries like Taiwan and Israel, they try to be successful in the world economy today. They're just basically a city with some nice countryside around it, which is even better for digital nomads. So we already see that the city state is returning. Estonia, Slovenia, countries like that are favored right now. They're much more interesting than China or America. This is where digital nomads are heading. And they're heading there specifically to find other people of the same bent. And then if you go to say Roatan, Honduras, and you find a Bitcoin community there, Everything, their religion, political ideology, everything is synchronized between people within a very, very strong subculture, like a sect or a cult almost tied to the Bitcoin. And suddenly that is a really thriving community. So thriving, it could easily have skyscrapers within the next five years. That is the power of digital nomadism. And this is where it's different than just Porter trying to sell itself. Although that's also the case. It, it, it's a market out there to become this place that that is attractive to digital nomadism and its capital. I agree with Daniel. I'm just adding to that picture that digital nomadism is more than that. Digital nomadism, if, if I can just expand on that. Uh, digital nomadism is a, can be thought through a philosophy of mobilism and of motion and of lack of place uh, and process. And focusing on process means that we focus on that things nomads do. They move around, they work their sell, they sell their shit. It's always been the case. And they move to the next place and they meet people and they create their networks. And it's a mobile flow. It's a mob, it's mobilistic. So the landscape changes and can change really fast. And it's going to be changing in a more erratic way in the future. So today, this city is the hotspot tomorrow. Who knows what the hotspot might be today? This, uh, sort of niche in the market is the hotspot tomorrow another one will be my god haven't we not seen since 2017 until 2022 the griftosphere pivot every three months onto a new ideologue onto a new coach uh yes we have so it's it's the motion and the process and the craft of that process that i strongly suggest we must uh, begin thinking as opposed to the fixed technologies, the fixed places, the fixed networks. So, no, I, I agree nice. totally, but I would add event, but it's a different type of event that's added to the process. I think we're all going to live in process of event from now on, as you know, judging by a book title coming out soon. But on top of the process, there's the event. So, what is the event that you're concerned with if you want to be successful as a whole for digital, digital nomads, knowing they're going to pass through? Oh, you become a specific home for a specific subculture. You don't just become another Bali or another Porto that's just trendy for a while and then is out and dated. No, you want to become a Jerusalem. You, you want to become a place where a specific subculture feels more at home than others. So you have a stable digital nomadism that comes and returns to this very same place all over and over again. And, you know, it could be over generations if you're really good at it. And that's where the event comes in. I agree. It's an event tied to the process. But you know me. I hate eventology without nomadism at the bottom. I think Christianity and Islam were terrible in the sense they tried to disconnect the event from the process. I think there's a perfect example of we're living in an age where we'll finally realize the process and event are tied together. The, the process is if you're just another place that's in for three months and everybody moves on, disaster quicker than ever to happen. But if you actually manage during that time to knock into, to, 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 to nail it with a certain subculture, for example, like Ruatan Honduras is trying at the moment, 
then that specific subculture will stay in a way, but it will be represented by different people who come and go as a process. Almost like a Stonehenge or a Gobleki Tepe, where we establish a little phallus here and people come, they stay and they go. And while they're here, they live by these rules and they believe it and then they move. The topology of this system that I just described is a little bit shaky in my head, but it, yes, I think it ties back to that initial idea that, that I wanted to stress, which is the ability to determine within this course where is north, where is south, where is east, and where is west, is the, two, is the true science and craft of nomadology that allows you to design values, design community, design influence and belief, and all else follows from that. The whole economy follows from that. The whole world, people's desire, people's love, money, everything just is downstream from that. I have a little question to ponder here. It's Daniel you used that word griftosphere, and I like that. And I wonder, do you envision the world of the nomads staying beholden to the kind of rather cutthroat dynamics of the griftosphere? Or are you imagining a kind of um, softening or socialization of these types of communities? I think uh, competition is going to become more brutal within the griftosphere. More people are going to get in on it because of AI and the ability that it gives people, uh, especially generative large language models and image generation models. It gives people the ability to produce content en masse. So, you know, probably 20% of my Twitter feed is already kind of chat GPT generated or at least helping these folks cut down their time that they spend on producing content by like 90%, right? So it's much easier to get in at the lower levels. So the competition is much bigger. Uh, so what does this create an incentive for? Um, the architect phenomena. A couple of few big winners uh, that are able to just win at the griftosphere and create these little gobleki tepes or stone hinges that we were discussing that people simply follow. Um, and that's, I think, the, the next generation of the griftosphere. So I think I mean, that's weird. That's that's saying that sort of this digital nomad phenomena will be slave to the algorithm. It's already slave to the laptop and to mobile computing from the get go. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. And and like this is this is the frustrating part. And this is why I think there is something very not special about digital nomadism is like wherever people move or whatever the fuck happens, like. They, they, they will still be slave to, you know, the, the discourse and the sort of incentives of the of YouTube algorithms, of curation engines, etc. And like these things shape people and the way they think. And if you if it turns out the way you say that there's a small amount of winners and the, and the bunch of everyone else and the winners sort of figure out how to hack this this discourse such that they they manage to like pull people in, into their cities or or whatever and, and and maybe you've just outlined the program for the challenger brand of the griftosphere that's going to win in the next 10 years so you have no, but wait the a second, wait and you have the challengers who disbelieve uh, who don't like this dominance and who are about the freedom and the motion yeah, but wait, don't think urbanization here. We're moving away from large cities. They're dead and over. I mean, they, they have crisis everywhere. Uh, America is already going towards smaller cities. You know, you move to Bend, Oregon today. You don't move to New York City unless you're an idiot. So that's already over. I think the pattern we're looking at right now is much more like uh, the algorithm also reflects us. It's, it's, not, it's not run by anybody. It's just a direct reflection of our behavior and increasingly will be so. We'll get the manipulation of politics out of the algorithms eventually. We'll get the corruption of money. We'll get the conformation of academia mass media out of there. The old institution will all die and go. What we'll have instead is some new dark ages. You'll have a lot of different places co-successful. I'd say a pattern much better to look at than moving from rural to urban and higher concentrations of people because that's just idiotic. That, that's exactly what's, that's exactly where, where the somewheres are stuck. No, it's more like the Silk Road. So imagine you've got trading places along a Silk Road. 
And if you've got a trading place along the Silk Road, it's great that it's connected with other trading places along the Silk Road because it's likely next stop for digital nomads. So they fly off to the next stop along the Silk Road and they will look at their map increasing like a trading road. road. And what you have there are the cost tags. I, I tap it in. The word cost tag is, is a Persian word, which is the origin of our, of our, our word cloister and, and monastery. That's what I'm talking about digital monasteries. What you're really looking at here is a place where a few people stay for a rather long time and they like that, but they are interconnected with people who only stay for a while and then move on to the next place. So the cost tags are the ultimate stopovers along the trade route. They're spiritual places like monasteries. Outside you got the bazaar, you do the trade. That's where capitalism still occurs. You can have whorehouses or nightclubs, whatever you want to call them. You can have libraries. You can have anything you like in a small, a small, efficient, smart city. You could have that around you anywhere along the trading post. But what happens is that there are multiple places where different types of digital nomads, depending on subculture, will be, will, will, will be located. And eventually, if you're into a larger subculture, suddenly you have lots of different places to choose from where you can go and settle for a while until you move into the next place. I think that's a much more likely scenario than some winners being able to pull in large crowds into large cities. That was the advantage of running factories efficiently during industrialism and that caused urbanization. Urbanization is over. It's definitely old paradigm. What we're looking at here is like, uh, the ideal these days is to go to a city of about 2 million people at most, because you get all the advantages of a world city when you have 2 million people in the same place. You have no advantage left when you go towards 15, 20 million people. That means the largest cities in the world, Mexico City, Tokyo, Los Angeles, they're done. That's not the future, at least not the future of power. The, the Silk Road <clears throat> was a trade route. And these cast tags were stopovers in the middle of the actual flow of the road. A road is a flow going through places and stopping in places. But that flow brings capital, spices, silk, stuff to sell. Today's cast tags will be companies. And the nation state, cities, all of these things, um, they will be, it will be companies to take over this landscape. It's not going to be random cities here and there who have no connection to the flow of capital like unless it's connected to some way shape or form of creating money as the silk road was as the cast tags were the cast tags existed because people stopped there because they had money because they were in the trade that's what companies and corporations are going to become in the future they're going to pivot to being these little reality bubbles to attract people who are themselves on their silk road yeah but wait 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 that would be true if they'd be hotel chains Hotel chains are over. I do Airbnb. I go to Burning Man. Listen, if I want to Here's travel, if I want to be, if I'm motivated to travel at all, I don't want to go to the same place everywhere I go. The perfect example of the bad old idea of a hotel chain, this is pretentious, is Soho House. Have you stayed in the Soho House ever? It's just disgusting. Airbnb, boring, right? Airbnb is still a company. Like what's yeah, but the, the place you stay is not Airbnb. That's just a booking service for you to stay in different places every time you go with a different host. So that that's obviously there's got to be companies who do things shit like that. I mean, we all know we have tech startups exactly like that. But hotel chain is very different from Airbnb when, I'm, when it comes to the actual experience of staying there and being motivated to be nomad in the first place. I mean, nothing prevents me from settling somewhere, staying there and probably accumulating more money and I can still work in one place. And that's still an option, but it's the just place, boring as fuck. But and that's exactly what I want to move. So I don't want to go and stay with the same Soho house or the same fucking hotel shirt and everywhere not, I go. No. Absolutely. Like, I, I think the point is like, uh, the, que the question is whether things can become small and whether we can escape the, the like ev everything needing to be big to, to be su successful and uh, get inside the flow of capital. If we can get inside the flow of capital by being small, uh, this is like an interesting proposition. I think the, the, the hotel is the wrong example here because the hotel presupposes that whoever's going to stay there has found the money to pay for their stay somewhere. Where do they get that money? It's the, precisely the flow of capital that we must focus on, not the locations. That's what I mean is true nomadism. So wait, 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 wait. Uh, don't we agree the flow of data is even more important than the flow of capital here? Aren't you just stuck in no paradigm here? No, no, no. As long uh, and 
the point at which that happens will come when people learn when when the new data industry actually booms and booms in a democratic way in the same way that say the design industry boomed in 2011 and the startup industry boomed in 2011 and the craft coffee shop industry boomed to, to speak your to, to your example of the small uh, small thing the craft coffee industry boomed in the early 2010s and it boomed because, precisely because all these people made their money in the tech industry they get the money in order to buy the whole hotel uh, stays to buy the coffee so if the hotel is the big company and the coffee place is a small company they still get to have their they, they still need to make their money somewhere otherwise digital nomadism doesn't work that's why this is what's missing alexander in your account of the silk road the silk road was a trade route so where do the digital nomads of the future make money that's going to be the central thing and that's why i say that the cast tags are going to be companies because companies pay people so you're Absolutely. mixing up Absolutely. two different things. You, you, you're fixing yourself geographically with a cost stock. Companies are not going to be located anywhere physically at all. Well, it's still, can, it's can, still we get, can we get exactly, the, yeah. exactly, exactly. But they still pay people, and therefore wait, people wait, will be nomadic. I think not Seth has a fast. Wait, Seth has a fascinating comment here. Can we get in some new voices, maybe in the, into the conversation? So. Have you checked on that, Owen? I think Seth has a fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was planning to open up for Q and A in a second, but actually. Why not? Because we were planning to do six people, only three here. So I think you can open up earlier. I think it's a fantastic proposal from Seth. So we can have that. Yeah. Yeah. I do think the thing that Daniel raises is interesting to think about resources. So this will be my point, and then over to Seth. Um, Thinking that a lot of what we're we're talking about here, I'll play a big devil's advocate, assumes that we're going to remain relatively wealthy. Energy is going to remain cheap. Borders are going to remain open, and planes are going to continue to fly. If a new dark age is coming and there is a predict that actually there's going to be a lot of contraction outside of the city states, then I presume there's going to be some kind of triage decisions over what flights continue to fly and what Wi-Fi stays on and who can plug into that. Now, it may well just mean the, the increasing class divide between the nomadic class and everybody else, but it also creates a more precarious world, especially if you have a nomadic class that work entirely through laptops and then all of the lights go out. Or the planes stop. But it's, that's not going to happen. There will always be, this is just competition, there will always be an exciting place for you to go anywhere that will welcome you because you pay taxes later. That will always be the case. So the, no, that's not what I mean with the dark ages. What I mean with the dark ages is a loss of center. A total loss of center for humans, meaning that we're all going to be locally located. And then we discover that the AI is totally centralized and global. That's exactly the experience you're going to go through over the next two decades. That's my point. I still don't think it satisfactorily hits the question of keeping the economies booming enough to keep providing this nomadic lifestyle, the raw resources it needs to function. Yeah, there is like there is lack of nomadism in economics. Like you can go nomadic in discourse, you can go nomadic in, in location, but you cannot go nomadic in money and do with it. Because like it's like if you do stuff with technology, like people are stuck in the same big companies, right? Because like the threshold of actually doing something and like making a profit of it, like technology wise is like very, very high. Because like, if you're going to build a startup, you need a bunch of shit. Like it's not that simple to be nomadic with, with capital. I'd say not yet, but hey, Silicon Valley is dead and over. You can do yeah, your startup anywhere in the world not today. Solve it. Like, you can do that, your startup anywhere you want in the world today. Venture capital will come your way as soon as you're smart enough to do something that's a valuable business. That's already the case. <clears throat> can we get Seth into the conversation, John? Yes, yeah, Seth. Yeah. Come on. It's, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, Seth, you can come in. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I was just making the point that... Uh, you know, this isn't limited to physical localities. Um, you know, the idea of jurisdictional market places being able to opt out of one, opt into another, um, you know, either wholesale or piecewise, uh, um, that can happen anywhere. Um, and Web3 and Urbit and AI give us tools that aid in that. Um, you know, Web3 from the global sense, it's uh, trustlessness kind of gives you um, the ability to like coordinate on a more global scale. Um, Urbit gives you a stack for creating peer-to-peer -peer applications, which allows you to create arbitrary localities. Um, and you can kind of have your own set of rules. 
Um, but there's also like software distribution comes into play a lot. Um, I, I do disagree with kind of the idea that it's going to be companies and like which companies are succeeding. I think it's more, um, you can think, you can abstract that away and just say like, it'll be protocols. And if companies are in control of protocols and whatever other um, kind of levers of control and coordination, um, that's who kind of wins. Uh, what, what would be interesting here would be to make a little, like a map <clears throat> and to ask all the digital nomads of the world or to make like a little poll and figure out, okay, where do you guys get your money that allows you to travel to these places and engage with these different protocols? You're pro they're mostly probably freelancers. Um, and my gut feeling tells me that they work in tech now, a tech company, uh, you, know, the, you know, the typical digital nomad is a, is a designer, is a software developer, is a guy in a laptop in, in, in Bali, right? Uh, but the company they work for is a startup or, or some other company that, you know, deals with information. So what the digital worker is doing in the pipeline is like chewing up information, visual, code, whatever. And this company is able to remain affordable or rather to remain afloat and to make cash and to pay people and to grow because it sells tech to a huge swath of people because, it you know, like a small team of people is able to create a platform or software or service or whatever, typically that can, that can reach a huge swath of people, like a huge scale of people. So there's a, there's a connection. Like if, how to say, if there wasn't by using an app, whenever I download any app on my phone and I use it to speak in 2010s language, I'm effectively one of the, millions of people who are subsidizing the small group of folks who are actually building that app, some of which might be digital nomads. So there's a, there's a dependency there. And at the center of that dependency are companies offering services. In other words, how am I going to jump jurisdictions and so, 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 sorry, Danny, I'm this not is making money off of building a software that is sold to thousands and thousands and thousands of people? Where else will you be making but money? Daniel, this is a I very guess. limited image of digital nomadism. You're just talking about laptop or developers with a laptop. As soon as you go to a place where there's a critical mass of digital nomads running around the world, you start employing people who speak the language as yoga instructors and all kinds of shit. To do what? To be either yoga instructors or tech developers. I, I'm not Discourse. talking about tech. I'm talking about digital nomadism. I'm not talking about tech development. But where, you're, you're stuck do? with a certain profession here. I'm talking about do? people who move from one place to the next and take whatever profession they have with them. That's not only tech development. As soon as you got the tech developers moving around, you will have other professions moving around. And suddenly you have all kinds of people moving around, at least for 10 or 50 years of their lives. And that's already happening. And I don't, I, I, we shouldn't talk about digital nomadism today. We should at least be vision enough to talk about it like in 10 or 20 years. Well, it certainly will have grown a lot compared to the day. And exactly with Arabic and these new technologies, it becomes easier and easier and easier to be anywhere you like in the world to collaborate with people. That's that's collaborate and doing in what? technological development, right? Collaborate to do what? To do anything that has value in a marketplace, not just development of software. So, so what categories of things are valuable in the marketplace in the next 10 years? Oh God, we have no idea. Like 35, 40% of the economy 10 years is things you haven't even heard of today. That's definitely guaranteed. Can you just imagine what AI will result in with new kind of products and services that come out of AI? This is going to be another huge tech explosion. That's why it's so hard to predict what's going to happen. The only thing we can predict for sure in this conversation is that nomadism has an attractive value, at least for young people, for sure. And if they can move around more and see more place, experience more and meet more people and fuck more people, then certainly they will. And if they do, even if, even if tech developers are the pioneers, all the other crowds that goes with that follow. Say you open a mine somewhere, an industrial town. You got a few people working in the mine. Then you got people who develop the ore into a metal. Then you got people who develop the metal into all kinds of different products. Then suddenly you need schools, you need hospitals, you need all the other shit that goes with it. And suddenly you got a large city of 50,000 people. That's incredibly no, it, sedentary for a nomadic discourse. I, no, I, but I, but I, there's, there's, there's not many miners who are digital nomads. But, but I agree with you, and I want to sort of add to your point. Like, uh, you're correct in that. I agree that, like, the elements of value that the next 
the digital nomads of the tech next 10 years are going to latch on to to make money to pay for going to places and do anything there it's either going to be functional value or human value so it's either going to be like you do a thing that helps people like a tech like a protocol like a software like a whatever like an urbit or you do coaching you do one on one you do you do person to person you do pathos those are the two things they'll be able to sell it's called product and service. Just make it easy. So, Doosan in the house. Can we talk to Doosan, maybe? Owen, would you like to get Doosan in? He's in. Can we get Doosan? And a report from Honduras, maybe. That could be great. Hello, guys. Can you I hear do. me? Yeah, you're an hour late, man, but hello. Nice to see you. I had it in my calendar for, for 3 p.m. This is... Uh, so I was like two hours uh, different. The, I, I'm, I'm very surprised that it started today, right, the, right now. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm well, sorry. Uh, like... No worries. Um, hello. And um, we asked everyone at the start to, uh, to introduce themselves and just say a little bit about like who you are and what you do. So maybe you could do that very quickly and then that'll give some new material for us to start riffing with. I will. I will. Um... I heard about miners that you were speaking and uh, I'm one of them. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin miner. I'm a Bitcoin educator for six years um, from Slovakia. That's my nationality. But right now I'm based in Honduras, in a beautiful island of Roata. Why? Because uh, here is a special economic zone called Prospera, where we set up our Bitcoin education center, the first one in Honduras. And we're helping people to understand what is Bitcoin, how to not get scammed, how to not do the beginner's mistake. And uh, we are mining Bitcoin in Paraguay. So basically, that's our main um, main source of income. And we are using Bitcoin that we mine to fund our education activities here on Roatan and, uh, and, and helping people understand the future of money. Great. So the big devil's advocate question here is, didn't Bitcoin collapse? One more time. Didn't Bitcoin collapse? The price did, but the technology is ever growing. <laughs> more and more uh, nodes are turning on. Uh, the, the Bitcoin is still producing blocks every 10 minutes. So, um, you know, when you, when, once you're longer in the ecosystem, you realize that uh, it's, it's volatility is part of the game, the part of the free market. And uh, you just uh, learn to live with it. So, um, but yeah, we can feel that uh, the, the people are maybe less interested right now because they're like, okay, maybe the game is over. But no, there are still a lot of people that uh, we are helping to, uh, to adopt Bitcoin in their business. And we are helping them set up um, new POS systems, wallets, um, payment infrastructure. So uh, yeah, the X system around us is showing that it's, it's growing. Yeah, and we then go back into the question of the denominism because I'd like to have Deuce's take on this. Uh, I, I proposed earlier in this conversation, like an mm -hmm. hour ago, that that we we should we should mention places like Dubai and Singapore in the fundamental sense that these places are already huge and successful, and people who live there basically vote with their feet. If they don't like what they can have in a dictatorship, which both Dubai and Singapore are, they just move on to another place. So there's a, there's a fundamental aspect of nomadism that you can move from one place to the next. And that's what you do increasingly. What have you experienced in Roatan, Honduras, with the Prospera community? It's still quite small, but the people who, who come there, from what I gather, have moved around quite a bit. And what do they feel about coming to Roatan? And what is their relation to the place itself compared to other places where they've been previously? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Prospera, for those of you that don't know, it's a special economic zone here in Honduras. It's uh, um, the constitution of Honduras allowed to, to, to these economic zones to be created called ZS. Um, and yeah, we moved here because uh, the, the laws and jurisdiction is very in favor of um, crypto startups or Bitcoin in general. There is basically no legal tender. So you can use Bitcoin or any other asset, a gold as well as a, as a legal tender. You can accept it in your business. Um, the people around are very um, oriented towards building things to a really... Uh, pushing things forward, testing these new um, legislations and, and new jurisdictions. So um, you can set up a company in 15 minutes here. You can set up your e-residency. And uh, if, you've, if you have your tax residency here as well, after a couple of months, 
um, then uh, it's a territorial taxation here. So you don't need to pay taxes uh, from income that is outside of Prospera as well. So it's also some something positive. Um, I, as a person, I have right now residency in Paraguay, um, also for tax purposes, but also because we are mining there. So I'm currently, I, I cancel my residency in Slovakia and Europe and moving right now in between Roatan and, uh, and Paraguay. So uh, it's very favorable to our digital, digital nomads. Um, so yeah, they, they help you to operate your business online, everything. You don't need to visit any uh, physical institutions. You can do everything that you need for your e-governance to do online in a platform, which is super UX friendly. Basically, the, the, the team behind Estonian e-government is the same team that, that is developing uh, e-Prospera platform for, for Prospera, which is like, they're doing great work. How long does that process take? Um, to set up a residency, and, and it's like 10 minutes thing. Uh, you have a couple of various residencies, like e-residency is uh, allowing you to spend here in Prospera uh, 180 days and allows you to set up a company. And it's the process takes like 10 minutes. And in the end, you just pay uh, a fee. It's a annual fee. I think it's $130 per year is the residency fee and, and that's it. And then you can set up companies. You can basically come here and uh, you have a permit which you show uh, when you're entering Prospera is like a ID card, something like that. And they let you in, you can co-work here in the, in the buildings. Um, you can use the services. So uh, it's a very simple process. And I just ask then Dusan, who's the enemy? Where do you see conflict coming? Is it from inside the community or or, I mean, is it from outside the community? Is it from the old establishment? Have they even noticed that you guys are doing what you're doing already or, or has to pass them by completely? Yeah, so the biggest enemy, um, if, if you Google out about Prospera, uh, the, the biggest enemy is the Honduran government because the new government, it's very socialist oriented and it's very anti-private property. Basically, this uh, creation of ZS, the zones of economic developments, is a creation of previous government. So the current president is very against it, and they um, they are basically they cancelled the ZL law, so no more ZS can be created. There are only three in Honduras, one of which is Prospera. Two of them are on mainland Honduras. So no more ZS will be created, and the rest of the ZS have a uh, um, multiple years kind of freedom from Honduras. So Prospera by constitution should have 50 years of freedom, um, which right now Honduras is kind of in the vacuum of either confirming that or not. But uh, legally, um, they if they would not confirm that they would go against their own constitution, it would be a huge uh, fail on international scale for Honduras itself and for in international investments. So nobody thinks that this is going to happen. But again, Honduras has the people with the guns, so the government can decide anything. So this is basically uh, right now the, I would say the only um, enemy. But uh, as far as time goes, there are more and more people that are like uh, turning the other side, seeing this as a nice opportunity for international investment to come, uh, for businesses to be to be set up here, and and Hondurans getting uh, better paying jobs. So this kind of negative connotation was one two years ago but right now it's it's slowly changing and turning in a more positive way but yeah, there are still some groups and of people that are against it which is normal because this is something new something different and they just see it as you know the capitalists taking their land um uh, which is you know every time this this kind of fight between socialism and capitalism let's say how much influence do you guys have in the sort of political decisions that are going on around it? You mean in, in Honduras or in Prospera? Um, in Honduras. Um, who I cannot tell exactly, but um, since I'm not, let's say, um, employed by Prospera, I cannot tell uh, these kind of maybe legal questions, legal answers towards Prospera as, as jurisdiction. Um, but there are a lot of people... Um, 
from US involved. The Prosperous founders are from Venezuela, Guatemala, so um, multiple countries. And uh, there are quite a lot of people inside of the government or, or um, you know, courts and the legal system that are in favor of these ZS because they already claimed or like already shown that a lot of capital came here in a couple of tens of tens of millions of dollars thanks to ZS. So I think this creates influence, but I I'm not sure how is like the uh, who's who, who's for what and these kind of things. So it would be very hard for me to answer the question. Sure. Can I ask, I you, already... can on, ask you if you have an alternative plan? You, you, you already mentioned Paraguay. We obviously do your Bitcoin mining. So obviously you and your community have discussed that there's another possibility. Because my friends in Dubai and Singapore, they used Dubai and Singapore as alternative addresses to begin with, but they certainly mm -hmm. have plans and there are other places they consider moving as well. So they're just more large scale already and they're not connected to the Bitcoin community, whereas you are the pioneer of what I think is the next wave of digital nomadism. So you can elaborate if you have an alternative plan. What about Puerto Rico, for example? Hmm, these are research well yet for me um it's very fresh in the end it's very like i just came here first time last year and basically we moved here for six months one month ago so it's it's very fresh and also paraguay i'm a paraguay resident for a couple of months so that was my first choice uh paraguay as a, for for digital nomad as and i set up a company there my activities um permanent residency and then the Roatan came as the option. So I have kind of like this plan B and C, Roatan and Paraguay. Um, so if, I don't know, if something happens here with Prospera and we would need to go away, but I don't think so. I think the next step for me is is Paraguay. If Paraguay is not the option, I am I was thinking also Dubai maybe because I have a couple of uh, friends from the space there and uh, they're kind of happy there. So, uh, so yeah, um, these are these are kind of the options that I, I see fit, um, but didn't didn't have like a lot of plans uh, be, besides Roatan and Paraguay. Yeah, I just noticed you didn't mention the United States or China or Russia or any large imperial ambition here. So no, is, it, it seems that the community you're talking about here understands that the small place you can actually influence, say, local politicians and, and then try your subcultural idea and see if it works. For example, Bitcoin seems to be mm -hmm. the idea, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, maybe Salvador, El Salvador would be interesting way to go uh, if, if things have failed. I think Central America in general for me is very appealing. Uh, the culture, I'm, you know, I'm dancing Latin dances for 10 years. So Latin culture is very, um, something I very like. So I think being in this area, that's, uh, that's something yeah, I, I would see fit if Honduras is, is not the place for any reason. We have Elisa who just joined us and who moved to El Salvador for similar reasons to you. Is there any chance we can have beautiful Lisa join the conversation? What do you say? There she is. There's Lisa. Hello. The floor is yours, Lisa. Tell us about El Salvador and what you're doing there as a digital nomad or whatever you call yourself. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, yeah. Alexander and everyone. Um, right, I think, uh, Dusan, it's really interesting to hear your perspective. I've, I've just been, I just moved here this month. I was in Brooklyn and then I tried uh, relocating to Florida and the United States just isn't working for me right now. You know, maybe never will again. So I'm I'm uh, very aligned with a lot of Alexander, your work and these discussions. I, I think I wanna make a, you know, I don't have a lot of insight into Bukele's current, I, I know he's, you know, he has the highest supposedly approval ratings of you know, blah, 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 whatever the metrics mean. But uh, El Salvador obviously is, is earlier uh, in this um, process than Honduras and Ecuador uh, in various ways. But uh, yeah, I came, one of the reasons I came here, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, but I am really into Urbit and I I'm trying to get my mind around how I would use it in an eventology sort of way. 
Um, my, I want to make a quick comment about really what I'm doing. I have a background in design also. What I'm really, I want to make a quick comment about the tension uh, between Daniel and Alexander's opinion today is really, I think, fascinating and important. I was, from my naive, distant perspective, it seems like Facebook, Meta, and Urbit are still using spatial taxonomies. Uh, but I wonder if, Yuri, if you would have anything to say about how that may shift or flip. I'd be really curious about that because the, the approach I'm really taking with my own convenings and different activities that I want to launch, I also want to build a business, um, is around, I'm bouncing off of Daniel's comment about categories. For me, uh, as long as we're in the, the products and services category, I think it, it is counter to a Delizian event approach. When I can't wrap my mind around the category is when, that's where I wanna be when I, when I, I can't exactly wrap my mind around. So, what, so I'm partly preserving my own ignorance as I stab into this and just, I spent many years in China and I think I've been doing this all my life in some way or another. I'll stop there and see if there's any follow-up. What's your, what's your question about structural taxonomy, uh, spatial I wonder, taxonomy? Like, um, you know how with Meta, there, there's their NFTing, you know, real estate, virtual real estate, and with um, Urbit, the way the taxonomy of planets and universes and stars. I was just curious how that, I, I'd love to hear you speak into um, nomadology a little bit more about whether you think, it's interesting if, if space is disappearing as a relevant ontology in the digital nomadic age, then what, I'm just curious as to why that's still um, the paradigm or it seems to be, or maybe I'm not seeing it clearly. One thing which immediately comes to mind is friction and how like we should start thinking in terms of like things which are the most frictionless for us to do and where there is friction, which we are so used to, we do not see it as friction. Um, and so connecting that to Urbit, like the friction, it's, it's sort of like solves the friction of computers and the friction of web three or like web three has all these, you know, chains and, and Seth can talk uh, much better about this than me. Um, web three tries to, you know, do all these cross chain integration, this and that. And it's just like a failure because like there hasn't been a sound computing platform as on, on bottom of everything. And so what Urbit unlocks with Ukbar, which is a company building on Urbit, and it allows you basically to do any sort of payment, uh, however you want to structure it. And this was sort of the ideal of, you know, Web3. And basically Ukbar said, hey, we're doing this on Urbit and we will do everything on Urbit for the execution. And then for consensus, we will use Ethereum. And this base, and, and like, I think this is this, one of the strongest um use cases of herbit is saying like we can do whatever we want with money and we can do it super easily so you can do custom revenue shares you can do a bunch of stuff and you can do it frictionlessly and and you can take like a developer you can hire him for for some money and he he will do a custom implementation for you whatever you need and this is like reducing friction for software so that we can actually build stuff and coordinate and unlock new economies which we were not able to unlock before so like if space collapses, the, the next thing which needs, needs to collapse is friction. Because like if we are communicating, there's still friction and the less we have, the better. I agree with that. Uh, That's exactly why I'm advocating subcultures. Um, in the sense a subculture is a set of shared values and very often a shared language, to be honest, uh, which makes it, frictionless as a community. Uh, as I say, speaking on behalf about dinosaur my conversation about companies before, I'd say we're going towards a world of micro companies everywhere because any team you set up is basically a company for a period of time. 
And with the AI around, it's going to be really easy to just see the world as loads and loads and loads of micro companies and everything else as networks. That's exactly why I said Airbnb is not a way of life. Airbnb is just a connector, a network that sets tons of micro companies. Everybody who has a home where they like to host a digital nomad is part of the network. So this is this is different than saying that a company sets up places that are specific and you go with the company, which to me is a hotel chain. So I, I, I just want to make the difference between the network and micro companies. And micro companies is the future. Basically, the companies today are nothing but networks of micro companies being set up. And this is where we're heading because we, we, we pick the people we need for a certain team to work together for a while. And then the product is done and over with. And if they're from the same subculture, they're very likely to go back into the same team because we were successful in the past, no friction, meaning they can go into friction and be team working again. And maybe they change the team slightly from one time to the next. So that the teams change. This is the future work in that sense and getting things done. And it's actually... It is laptop driven in any community you go to or any kind of work you do, not just what we call tech today. That's exactly why it's so favorable towards digital nomadism. Do any of you have experience in being in this sort of micro company structure and how it differs, say, from a traditional employment structure? I live as a Sufi it's, monk. I live, I live as a Sufi example. monk with two other Sufi monks in Stockholm. We travel the world all the time. One of us is a professional data nomad. He's out all the time just because then he also experiences the whole thing. So the, 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 this, is, this is the kind of lifestyle that I guess is quite normal then for what we call digital nomads here. So uh, I just, just kind of point to Seth having so many fantastic observations being thrown in. Maybe I missed as well, but I would love to have Seth join the conversation again because he has he has some really good points coming up in the chat line that I think he would like to share. Is that okay? Seth, are you there? Yeah, sure. Um, I, was, um, I was just making the point in chat that basically like the metaphors or analogies we use are less important than like the actual um, things that the tech like enables, right? So like, uh, or the actual like architecture of the tech and the architecture of the tech um, and like the network topology and the computing infrastructure, like those enable, uh, you know, uh, coordination at scale or creation of localities and coordination there. Um, and the software distribution of model and, you know, kind of um, like that allows you to kind of, um, you, basically not having to rely on servers um, or companies um, being able to do things for yourself. Um, like that ability, um, like the access to the tools of creation, coordination, curation, like that is what enables nomadism in all kinds of contexts. Cool. I think a good place to start why I'm onto this topic because I live in Scandinavia. Scandinavia is a long, dark, boring as fuck winter, okay? It's fantastic in the summer. When the Mediterranean is too hot, Scandinavia is just the best place to be. So you have half a year when you love to be here and half a year when you'd like to go away. This is exactly where digital nomadism has taken off here. And what happens then is that you realize that you go online to find your best friends. You realize you go online to find collaborators. You realize you go online to maybe do your next tech startup or your next adventure, your next micro company you're going to set up, and your next team you're going to work with for a few months to deliver something, right? And then you realize you go online to find them, and they're not necessarily your neighbors anymore where you live. Next thing, though, is that there are advantages to being in the same physical space at the same time, especially if you're going to collaborate with people over a long period of time. We all know from the, the year of Zoom, the year of Corona, we learned this one important lesson. It was dead easy to execute ready-made decisions through Zoom meetings. So productivity went up the first six months. The next six months, productivity went down. And the, the last three, six months of the corona period, everybody was at everybody's loggerheads and at their each other's throats. Why? Because you couldn't innovate online, at least not yet. We're not there yet. So you needed to be in the same physical space to actually be innovative and creative. Now, that's great, though, that we know that. It just means that when I set up my plans for the next winter when I'm going to go to the tropics somewhere, because I always go to the tropics in the winter, that's my digital nomadism, um, I'm semi-nomadic. Then, of course, I go somewhere and tell people that I like to work with, I'm going to be there. It could be Honduras next winter, for example. So I'm going to be in Roatan. They would do a sound of these guys. I'm going to be there for like three months. And it, of course, turns out that the very people that are interested in working with me, being a product with me, where physical presence could be an advantage, but everything else being done online. We then go to that place and we could then invent digital semi-nomadism. 
And I, I think that's where it's heading uh, in the sense that you, you increasingly look at the advantage of being in the same physical space at the same time. So you have to meet, you have to be in the same space to do say real innovation or creation. But a lot for a lot of the other work, it could be different places. And you could basically say that parts of the year, I'm in the same place with the people I work. Parts of the year, I go to the same place with the people go that I work with. And parts of the year, I just go somewhere to isolate myself at a cost time with unknown strangers where I just focus on writing my next book or something like that. I think that variety is what we're looking at over the next 10 years. Got to make a lot of sense. Yeah, that point about the needing to be in physical space to innovate seems increasingly true for what I've been working on the last couple of years or so it's that exactly like you said once something's established and running it can do itself through zoom through telegram through gmail quite easily but getting people to get and it's actually quite fascinating getting people together who hang out mostly online for say three days in a physical space it's like an explosion because all of that tension builds up and then boom, everybody shares the same cultural symbols and reference points it's like a hyper meeting and of course you can drink and do drugs and do whatever the fuck else you want to do there as well <laughs> and and I, I do kind of I recommend that it's that people who are part of online communities get into the physical space together for a weekend for a week and I would add to that <clears throat> that for people who want to get into physical spaces and, and truly tap into the digital nomad lifestyle with all of its beautiful affordances that when they think about where they get the money to buy the plane tickets, they don't, they, they don't think tech first, but value stream first, uh, which is something that I, that I see a, a lot of, a lot of times. And it's something that I've been uh, very conscious about. And I think that the better we are thinking this, uh, the more nomadic we'll be because we'll be latching at what we'll actually like, pays the bills and we'll think about it properly um i.e the value it generates we'll think about it processually as opposed to thinking about it as a static thing because a thing is a mental territory it's sedentary i guess that's what i would add as a, as a processual point here so it's not like a tech for tech's sake precisely and 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 you know uh you know, human-centric design is the status quo in the design industry for the last 10 years, right? It's not new to anybody. You start with the needs of the user, and then you build your stuff around it. You don't think of the stuff first. Uh, but we need to be radical there and think about needs of the user as multiple needs, multiple flows within not an individual, but a individual, and how each of these flows plugs onto the great machine of capitalism and the internet, because that pays bills. Otherwise uh you will you will you'll be doing something that i have so often seen in wishful thinking creative types which is shiny toy syndrome and that gets you nowhere uh so truly we need to revamp how we think about this and that's what i'm kind of passionate about Oh, so can you explain what you mean with shiny toy syndrome so we don't misunderstand you? I probably agree with everything you just said. Yeah. Can you explain shiny, shiny toy, toy syndrome? syndrome? Is, is the, uh, is, is, well, to put it very simply and in 2010 terms, shiny toy syndrome is when you have a really cool technology, does a really cool thing, but nobody wants to use it. It's when you have a solution in search of a problem, you have a square and you try to hammer it into a round peg and it doesn't work. Uh, human-centric design presupposes that you start by asking the user questions like, what do you need? Like, what would you be willing to pay for? And then you figure out, and then you know how to build things and you build a thing for them. And I think that even this paradigm of human-centric design, which is already like a great way to start thinking, I think it's still very humanist or rather it's not human-centric enough. And so as we move into the 2010s, we'll be designing not things that solve things for humans, but humans themselves and the way that these humans plug into the flows of capital. And that's where we'd like become deterritorialized from identity in many ways. Uh, well, so that's, yeah, sorry. Finish. Yeah, no, go ahead. Oh yeah. I mean, that's like, that's a good argument for evaluating everything from the perspective of game theory. I think like yeah. actually like, I think that's an argument for technology and like designing with, um, like from the 
perspective of designing a protocol, like looking at uh, individuals and humans as actors or network participants, right? And you model their incentives and behaviors and motivations, right? Like it is all kind of downstream of that. Yeah, uh, I, th I, th I think I agree as long as you make this a human heavy, like 99% of, of the effort put into this is in understanding the human and their psychology, their libido, their needs, the way they fit into discourse, the values that they believe. And once you nail that, once you get that, then hell yeah, uh, you know, protocol. Yeah, I think I think the pairing of what you're saying, what I'm saying is like, is like what I mentioned plus empathy. Um, and like empathy as like an yeah, intentional it's thing. Just, it's not yeah, just well, I mean, uh, it, other, it, go it, ahead. I would say it's not just empathy. I would say it's a whole new craft of, it's, it's a whole new social, applied social science. Well, that's what I'm talking about, right? It's mechanism design and it's, and it's a uh, game theory. It's economics. It's a, uh, it's, it's a lot of things, right? Yeah. That's like, that's all the, and, and it's the engineering and the protocol design, right? Like everything outside of that is empathy, I think. So are you an engineer? Yes. And, architect, and I'm a yeah. designer. So this seems to be the typical, but, but I, we, we agree. We agree. Yeah. Can, I, then, can I have can I have Anis well, join guys, the conversation? I'm gonna jump in because there's there's three minutes left and we need to basically look at wrapping up. Alexander, make your comment up just now. I want Anis to have a word. Anis has made fantastic comments. I want Anis to join the conversation before this is over. So I leave it to Anis. I leave the floor to Anis. Come on. <laughs> well, the pressure. <laughs> um, we no. love Anis. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was I was really just thinking about this, um, what Daniel said about this other category of uh, digital nomads, the one who work in belief. Uh, and I'm seeing in all these areas where there are a lot of digital nomads, uh, there's also a growth of uh, mindfulness practices and consciousness and intimacy schools. And uh, I, I think that's like a really important part. I think that's what you, Alexander, talk about, about the spirituality or like the new religion of this age. Um, there's something that is being organically created because it's also responding to a need or in a way or, yeah. So um, I found that very interesting and I want to, uh, to add that in this discussion. Yeah, and I think that's something that we're thinking about developing together, Anis, and I think you're a great guy in leading that. And I think, in fact, I'm going to drop Anis in it. He was talking earlier about potentially writing a book. And I imagine it would be something like on a topic similar to this. So uh, now I've dropped you in it, Anis. Sorry about that, mate. And uh, right, I want to say to our panelists, uh, any final comments before we wrap up? I'll just tell this one comment following mm -hmm. Anis. I think next conversation we have digital nomads, let's look at their spirituality because I'm going deep on capitalism versus spirituality over the next few years. And I'd love to study what kind of practices to take with them as they travel along. Apparently yoga, meditation, all these things that are big along the Silk Road are huge for digital nomads. I'd like to find out more about that eventually. Yes. <clears throat> and I want to say that... Uh, we need to not only update the objects of our thinking, the things we're thinking about, but the methods of our thinking and to be playful with and, and trying to really update these for, for, the, for the current age is, is the step because we're going to be dealing with things that are so new that we cannot think about them in old ways, in the old, same old way, right? Uh, creating an app or a thing to solve a problem. No, 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 no. We're designing like humans and how they plug onto things. So this is a completely different paradigm in my view. So f keep updating methods and, and, and keep breaking old ways of looking at things. And then the things themselves, you can also be creative with those, but it's really the method, the relationship that I'm focusing on. So that'd be my point. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking how this conversation, well, at least Alexander frames it as it is bound to happen and a certain future is bound to happen, but I still think there's a lot of divergent futures that can happen. 
and we have a sort of a lot of power and like responsibility to build it the the right way or at least the best we can and like the future where algorithms eat us is like very close to the future where like we can have beneficial algorithms for us and like either one can happen and it's not sure which one will Great. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really nice note to leave it on. It reminds me of the thing I was thinking just, I know we've been saying that space might have collapsed and time is the new axis, but space could return if the planes stop flying, if the internet turns off. And it's worth actually thinking cities, structures that will be able to keep those infrastructure going and then the economies around that. Just having a tech class on its own isn't enough for that. Okay, I think with that, guys, I think this is a, we've done a great job with uh, <laughs> we've had to improvise and uh, and thank you to everybody for bearing with us with the technical difficulties and uh, with uh, with people coming in. Dusan, if you're still here, thank you for uh, for coming and um, yeah, check out the Parallax Sanga website and follow what we're doing. There's a there's a bunch more stuff. In fact, Alexander, you're back here next week to talk with Layman and Pascal about the deep roots of religion. And other than that, uh, have a good evening, everybody.